think probably the reason I've been asked to give this talk is because I spent several years working in non-viral gene therapy and then lastly I've been working in viral gene therapy. So maybe I can see some of the strengths and weaknesses across the field. It's a horribly broad title as you can appreciate. An overview of pretty much everything apart from cell therapy. Um, and for that reason it's um, either got to be focused in one or two areas or it's going to be terribly superficial. So I think I'll make it terribly superficial and cover most of the things that you might um, experience in more detail during the conference itself. Um, I am conscious that I could go on for far too long, so I'd be grateful if you'd stop after about 25 minutes, I'll leave. Oh, well. um, and um, if you want to interrupt me and answer questions, I'm very happy to do that. So you're all familiar with this slide, um, the feasibility threshold of gene therapy we've been battling against, the, the naysayers, many years now. Um, I think the field was first serious in the late 60s, early 70s, um, that gene delivery was a real problem until we realized that you could treat cells extra uh, outside the body. So, for example, the first experiment that French Anderson took with SCID ADA was to take hemophilic stem cells and to transduce them with a, with a retrovirus outside the body. That was very successful and gave a proof of principle to the field. Um, there were also reports at the time of some successful treatment of hypercholesterolemia. But then in the late 1990s, Jesse Gelsinger Gelsing died as a result of being given a very high dose of um, adenovirus vector by his hepatic artery. You probably know about this, this um, incident. He suffered body wide inflammation um, and, and died as a result of the treatment. Um, and that really knocked the stuffing out of the field. Subsequently, I think the development of this, of siRNA as a technology, sequencing of the human genome, and then demonstration that, that French Anderson's experiments are not alone, you can use similar approaches to treat several different immune deficiencies, have, um, have really boosted the field. We then realized that there would be leukemias if you had um, non-specific integration of viruses into the genome. Um, three patients developed leukemia in Paris, one in London. Um, and um, subsequently, things have picked up again We've had licensing of viral therapy in China, uh, which has not gone particularly well. It was licensed in 2005 um, to, to a company called Sunway Bio, uh, to China, Sunway Biotech um, as an oncolytic adenovirus, but there's been very little news on that since. Um, there were demonstrations of good adoptive T cell transfer with recombinant T cell receptors in 2006, and subsequently we've now studies in congenital blindness with intraocular injection of AAB. We've got successful treatment of myeloid dystrophy um, by the use of a lentivirus in cells that have been taken out of the body and then put back in. Um, and viral therapy is doing very well. JX594 is doing well for, for Generex. And Oncobex um, is doing extremely well for the company, um, um, which is not called Biorex, sorry, called Broad Kill Me. Broad Coffin's company. Um, Biorex. Which is looking as though it may be moving towards um, licensure, we hope, um, at some stage um, in the next year or two. Um, and then there are, there's going to be a nice story on AV8 for the treatment of hemophilia at this, this, um, this conference, which has been led by Anthony in the UCL. Okay, so the secrets of success, I would say, are delivery. Looking back, we've had an awful lot of failures and a few successes. And the successes have come when we've had direct injection or we've had ex vivo treatment or we've had viruses that can spread through tissues. All the involves around getting your therapeutic material to the site where it's needed. <coughs> Direct injection is a great technique to overcome the problems of, uh, of delivery. The other aspect that I think has been developed effectively is choosing the right vector for the right job. So with the benefit of hindsight, it seems strange that we used to treat genetic diseases with short expressing vectors like adenovirus to treat OTC. That was a perhaps one, not a potential cure for the disease. So if you want extended expression, we now tend to use viruses that are integrating, such as um, a lentivirus or a retrovirus, or like an AAV, a virus which um, doesn't appear to integrate, but does exist long-term as an epizoic vivo. And if you want short duration expression, for example, in cancer, if you want to kill cells, or if you want to make genetic vaccines, then plasmids can be very good, or adenoviruses can be very good. So the choice of the vector and overcoming delivery issues has been a real step forward in the field. So it seems to me that if I'm going to talk about gene therapy, then I need to define the area, and really I'm going to talk about the area where we use the vectors in vivo. So I think gene therapy is where we use the vectors in vivo. Cell therapy, or for the case of this discussion, GM cell therapy, 
is where we take the cells out and treat them ex vivo and then put them back in. So I'm not going to talk at all about GM cell therapy, despite the fact it's a huge field. My brief is to talk about gene therapy. So I think the simplest and potentially, um, well, not the simplest, one of the, one of the most promising applications of a relatively simple material are the use of anti-centology nucleotides for exon skipping. So you're going to hear about this from Francesco Montoni and from George Dixon in this, tribe, in this um, conference. And the idea here is to try to fix the expression of a long protein, dystrophin, which is a very long multi-exon protein. Um, and a very common form of muscular dystrophy relates to a mutation in the dystrophin gene that means it goes out of frame. And the idea of the antisensor, of the antisensor oligonucleotide skipping approach, the exon skipping approach, is that you can design um, antisense nucleotides that will recognize the RNA and cause the splicing zone to miss out the diseased exon. So you get a shortened protein, which is missing the material that was coded in one exon, but it's in frame. So you have shorter protein, but it has some activity. And you seem to be able to restore the phenotype of patients in this way by using um, exon skipping. That is a technology that could be used in a range of different diseases, but at the moment it's been widely developed, um, and it's been developed primarily for, for muscular dystrophy. In terms of what we might call gene therapy itself, it tends to revolve around the use of DNA, um, generally DNA with expression vectors, and the science of plasmidology has really moved a long way these days. So there are several different things, but I would imagine, given that Richard Harbaugh is in the room and Mike Antonio is in the room, I'm not going to pretend to talk about this in detail. This is their field, um, designing DNA to have clever functions. Um, careful choice of promoter, um, controlling the, the, the the timing of, of, of expression, controlling the, the, the location of expression, particularly removing inflammatory components from the, the DNA, because these are always packaged in, in well, nearly always packaged in, in bacterial cells, and so um, CPGs can be problematic. Um, and then it's possible to introduce either at the DNA level or by co-transmitting RNA specific functionalities. And having mentioned RNA, it does seem to me that RNA as a therapeutic vector is still woefully under-researched. We used to think that RNA could not be controlled in terms of its expression in the same way that DNA can because it has been promoted. But now we know that one technology at least, the microRNA binding sites, are very widely applicable and can be used in microRNAs to inactivate or to degrade RNA in sites where it's, where it's potentially toxic. So RNA is um, a potential vector, can be used for delivery, and it has the major advantage that it doesn't have to enter the nucleus. So if you're talking non-viral delivery, RNA is a very attractive possibility. The simplest way to deliver DNA is to inject it straight into the muscle, which is quite successful. This is a representation of hydrodynamic delivery, which was developed in the early 2000s. Um, it's a gross approach to take a very large volume of liquid and to inject it intravenously, in this case in the tail of a, a, a mouse, um, in order to deliver contained DNA into the, into the liver. What we think happens is that the, the large volume of fluid enters the venous circulation. It overloads the heart and back flows into the, um, into the hepatic vein. And I suspect it simply inflates the vein and stretches everything. You get a lot of extraization of the fluid containing the DNA into the parenchyma of the liver, and you then get quite a lot of transgenic expression, sometimes much more than this, in the liver. So a very simple approach to obtain hepatic selective transgenic expression. The argument is that it's a simple approach, it can be repeated. Um, if you have a good vector, there's going to be little immune response against it, and it can be used for a variety of different liver diseases. Um, in principle, this technique is not very good in humans because it would require seven liters to administer into a human to inflate the liver sufficiently. You have to do seven liters in about 10 seconds, and you also have to grow a tail to do it. So, what you can do in humans is to use a localized system where you make the injection um, directly into the um, inferior vena cava to, 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 um, to inflate the liver in that way. And in that way you can achieve this with about 200 milliliters of, of fluid. So it's doable, it's still experimental, but it may be that this goes somewhere. I wanted to talk about the development of more sophisticated um, self-assembling non-viral vectors. And it seems to me that if you start with um, DNA, then very often we complex it with either a polycation, so you have an electrostatic interaction between the negatively charged DNA and the positively charged polycation, or a polycation uh, lipid, um, which will give it, in addition to um, complexation, will give it some hydrophobic properties for memory permeability. 
bit of complex, um, and you can then address that at a variety of different technological levels by introducing different biological components. So, for example, you might introduce um, INF7, which is a, a peptide from influenza that gives endosomal permeability. Or you might introduce hexon from ant 5 to give it receptor targeting activities. What you're effectively doing here is building something that's got biological properties that gets and gets more and more like a virus. So we're really seeing these two technologies converge between the simple delivery approach that can be made more biologically system, sophisticated, and the virus which may become tamed. And some people are taking viruses and coating them with polymers in order to convert into rather sophisticated biological particles that look on, from the outside like simple polymeric um, particles. Now apart from biological properties, you can introduce chemical strategies and you can introduce degradable cores, you can introduce pH responsive um, components, shape changes, um, or you can stabilize the external surface using coats to stop things falling apart in the bloodstream. Um, and you can use a variety of payloads. I've already mentioned um, the use of mRNA. You can, use com um, you can use combination of mRNA and DNA, and that's quite a nice approach because there you may be able to use the mRNA to express something that's transient that would then change the phenotype of the cell. For example, it might break down the nuclear membrane to allow the DNA to get into the cell. Um, how do you could if you wish to use virus genomes? These are some of the agents that are used, some of the polycatons that are used in our viral vectors. Um, they tend to be complex DNA to form blobs, which often look like this. If you um, play with the, with the chemistry of the polycatan, you can make um, extended shapes, which are, um, in this case, more like worms. Um, this is one which um, is a very discrete particle, but a wormy structure. Um, and these materials can be tailored to different properties so that they have virus like abilities to bind to receptors, to enter the cells, to become reduced, to be released into the cytoplasm. If it's mRNA, it may be expressed there, and then it has to enter the nucleus. That was all I was going to say about something I feel I've worked in for 10 years. Um, we're now, um, I'd like briefly to mention these lipids. So cationic lipids don't really form particles, and although we call them cationic liposomes, they're not liposomes as most people represent them. They tend to be more hydrophobic particles, and they tend to be blobs. If you look at them um, by EM, you find that cationic lipid DNA complexes are a bit like that. They're not very well defined, they're, they're large extended hydrophobic structures. And they're membrane active. These are polylysine DNA complexes, but these are the cationic lipid, these are dotac complex, dotac cholesterol complexes. Um, these are harder to deliver systemically, but they do have good transfection activity, and they're currently being explored in cystic fibrosis clinical trials by inhalation um, with GL67 as the cationic lipid. And you'll hear Richard Riesenbach talk about this um, tomorrow. Um, in, uh, in respiratory sessions. So this is for the treatment of, of cystic fibrosis, where they're delivering DNA encoding the CFTR gene uh, by, by um, in, inhalation. And then just to wind up on the field of non-viral gene delivery, I think when we go systemic, there are major challenges to the use of vectors. Um, if you're trying to develop a vector that's going to go intravenous to reach a disseminated target like a cancer, you've got to be able to deal with plasma proteins. Plasma proteins can destabilize vectors that can be a real challenge to um, simple self-assembling vectors. In addition, erythrocytes can very often bind to particles that have got a very high surface area and are negatively charged, so they can bind to polycations and free up the DNA in a cooperative binding reaction that's very destructive to particles you might put in the circulation. If you have to avoid plagiocytes, if you're trying to access the tissue, you have to undergo extravasation, you have to get through the underlying basement membrane if there is one. And if it's um, normal cells, then you probably want to avoid them if that's not your target. If it's a cancer, you want to target the cancer cells, but you want to avoid the, the stromal fibroblast and other cells that may be in the tumor. So there are a lot of challenges that this field faces. Which is why I, for the rest of my 25 minutes, will talk about um, nature's vectors, which are viruses. These are DNA viruses, to some them. There are clearly a large variety of viruses which could be used for um, our purposes. There are also a range of RNA viruses. These are positive strand RNA viruses and these are negative strand RNA viruses. There are too many here, too many possibilities, too many exciting opportunities, frankly, to talk about. But what I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail are herpes viruses and also other viruses, particularly a then associated virus. So this is Richard Wade Martin's work. It's, it's not quite a herpes virus, but it looks like a herpes virus. 
What Richard's using is a special packaging system that allows him to encode herpes virus amplicons within um, herpes virus capsids. So they look like um, herpes viruses, but they don't have herpes DNA in them, or at least not very much. And because they're so big, 150 kilobases, you can put in genomic DNA. So you can have genomic um, regulation of protein of, of uh, gene expression, which is a great step forward because one of our problems has always been trying to use CMV to drive your transgene. It's not responsive to the body. It just gives you a high level of expression. It can be toxic. So using genomic promoters can be very sensible. And the herpes virus vectors give a way to do that. What Richard's um, recently validated this for doing is the, um, the delivery of LDL uh, receptor and has shown that he can obtain sterile sensitivity. So when he's adding sterols to his transducer cells, he's able to decrease the LDL um, in, in the circulation by, by regulating the expression of the promoter. Um, so that's an interesting technology for expression of regulated genes. This is AAV, um, and now I'm going to mention one or two of the applications of AAV. The first one that made a major breakthrough was um, in, uh, from two laboratories simultaneously, one of which is Robin Allen's laboratory here in uh, Moorfields and at UCL. Um, using AAV2, expressing a, a gene called the RP65 gene, which is a retinal pigment epithelium gene, he realized that if you injected this virus, which is a very small DNA virus but has no known pathology, Injected under the retina in people with degenerative nebus congenital amaurosis, and you could restore the function of RPE65 in those cells. And the problem with this disease is that people gradually lose their sight as they get older. And by restoring RPE65, he was able to show signs of halting the, um, the degeneration of sight in his very first studies. And they've now gone on, on to do further studies, which are looking very promising for this approach. Um, it was published in 2008. Actually, this week, and I, I'm allowed to say this, but it's embargoed with the press until 5 o'clock, um, we just launched a trial doing something similar in Oxford um, using also an AAV2, but this time treating uh, another blindness disorder called choroid uremia. And this is under the leadership of Robert McLaren. Uh, Robert's going to be here at the weekend um, to um, talk about this. Um, and the idea here is to use the same approach, AAV2 injected under the retina and um, expressing the uh, REP1 gene in order to prevent choroidal degeneration. So in this diseased um, retina, you can see the white areas are areas where the choroid is breaking down. Um, and um, that means you get loss of visual function. People gradually get less and less um, sight as they get older. It's a more common disease than levers, um, and I'm delighted that we've now initiated this kind of trial. Um, I want to mention Glibera, which is um, an AAV agent that's been developed for the delivery of lipoprotein lipase. Now, uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency is a, a disease that um, gives high levels of circulating lipids and carnomicrons, and it's um, quite a nasty disease because it can give very unpleasant pancreatitis that can be fatal. Um, it gives a lot of abdominal pain, can lead to diabetes and atherosclerosis. These are some of the symptoms of it. The idea with um, Glibera is to use um, is to use an adenovirus, sorry, this is the slide I'm looking for, an adeno associated virus, this small virus that's um, had all of its virus genes taken out, um, and to encode in it the um, lactoprotein lipase gene, and to inject it into the muscle in order to express um, lactoprotein lipase from the muscle, then secreted into the circulation and shown to decrease circulating lipids. So the development of that has been quite successful. Um, um, and um, currently we're having um, ongoing discussions about um, the, the future of this approach because it seems to me that this is a very important <coughs> platform that could provide a, a lot of useful applications for gene supplementation purposes. This is the concept of virotherapy um, and here we're treating cancer and the idea here is to make a virus which is selectively replicating and lies in cancer cells. So in this schematic this is an adenovirus um, infecting um, cancer cells and replicating. When it gets into normal cells, the idea is that it doesn't replicate, so there's no spread through normal tissue. You may kill one layer of, of cells, but that's not of significant, um, um, it's not significantly dangerous. The virus replicates selectively in tumor cells and then spreads from cell to cell, lysing them as it goes, and can, um, in principle, um, eat its way through tissues and eradicate the, the tumor. So this has been developed by several different groups using several different lytic viruses. And one of the things I like about it is the power of the approach. 
So I'm working with cancer therapy, and these are my friends, tamoxifen, danarus, and every, these sorts of things. The drugs we use in people, and this is killing cells. This is cell viability. This is 100% cell viability. And when we use conventional drugs, they tend to kill cells with an IC50 roundabout micromolar, thereabouts. That's typical. It's really quite a shock that when you convert viruses, and these are a variety of different um, adenoviruses, on the same scale, you find that they're a billion times more powerful. On a molar basis, the virus is a billion times more powerful than a chemotherapy agent. On a weight basis, it's about 100,000 times more powerful than a chemotherapy agent. Um, they're incredibly potent agents. Um, in principle, they can do a lot of good if we could use them properly. They're also highly selective. So this is just some figures I put together from the literature looking at the IC50 carboplatin in cancer cells. It tends to be around about 5 micromolar. In normal cells, it's hard to get this figure, but it's about 50 micromolar probably. And so you have a selectivity for cancer cells about tenfold. With some of the viruses that we've got, because they're cancer selective on the basis of genetics and interferon response and so forth, you can have selectivities up to, in our case, 3,000 fold. So not only very powerful, but also highly selective. So um, in principle, very interesting approaches. These are the viruses that have, some of the viruses that have been developed and that are being developed. So adenovirus is being developed, uh, again, the product license in China some time ago, um, it's being developed around the world in different groups. We're currently developing a group B adenovirus in, in my group. Pox viruses I'm going to talk about because this, this is where Biovex have, um, no, sorry, Biovex have worked with herpes viruses. Pox viruses are where Generex have developed, JX594, which is a form of vaccine. Um, measles virus is being developed at the Mayo. Newcastle disease virus was developed from Wellstat and has been through several clinical trials. Rhea virus is developed and is in many clinical trials around the world um, led by analytics. And BSV is an experimental virus that many, many scientific groups are looking at at the moment. The selectivity of these viruses can be regulated um, and, or can be natural. So you can use tissue selective promoters to make them selective for the, the cancer type of tissue. They can be driven by hypoxia or by estrogen. And hypoxia is actually a very good way of making something cancer selective. It's trying to counterintuitive, but I didn't think it would be very selective, but the results with hypoxia seem good. You can regulate the viruses by um, engineering microRNA sites into them as well. Or you can design them to be complemented by an active cell cycle. Um, very often they are um, complemented by deficient interferon signal, so active interferon can knock out a virus quite quickly. But tumors often have got deficient interferon signal. It seems that many viruses do well in tumors for that reason, and myxoma is a very good example of that. Deficient DNA repair pathways failing to signal apoptosis may be another component. Um, mutations in tumor suppressor genes also failing to trigger apoptosis. All these things appear to contribute to the cancer selectivity of, of viruses. So this is um, Oncovex. Um, these are slides from now uh, Amgen, uh, which recently bought Biovex. Um, it's a herpes simplex based on the virus. Um, it, I think it's a combination of virotherapy and immunotherapy. Um, there's certainly lytic virus replication, but there's also a systemic anti-tumor immune response generated by this lytic replication. And it appears to be augmented through the way the virus is armed, because it's armed to express GMCSF, the cytokine GMCSF is secreted. So I think it's a very interesting concept that they say it has the benefits of an autologous vaccine without the complexity. We'll hear Rob Coffey talk about this on Monday morning in one of the final plenary sessions. These are the genes that have been modified or removed in Oncovex in order to make it cancer selective. So they've taken out um, ICP34.5, which is important in that ICP34.5 normally dephosphorates E1F2-alpha to, to block um, in, in order to, to regulate um, protein um, expression. So by deleting that, they, they've, um, they've stopped the virus defending itself against the cell's, um, the cell's innate response, effectively, um, and in that way made it cancer selective. They were imaginative in the beginning because they actually isolated the new herpes virus strain, an HSV1 strain, from the lip of one of their scientific workers. Um, so it was a new isolate, and it was very virulent, and that seems to make a big difference. Um, and I think that's part of the secret of their success. Um, they found that deletion of ICP35 um, increases the replication um, because they have increased expression of US11. Um, they've deleted ICP47, which normally um, 
blocks antigen presentation, but by depleting that, they've allowed antigen presentation, and so the virus can be recognized by the immune system. And they've inserted GMCSF. And these are some of the data um, that they have generated over the years. This is um, mouse H20 lymphoma. Um, the animals are injected into the right flank and into the left flank of the tumor. And when the tumors become established, they get treated just into the right flank. So you see, if you look on the left here, is the right flank. It's going to be great, great mixtures. On the left, um, you can see the control tumor is growing quite, quite quickly here. When they're injected with Oncovex, um, the tumors um, shrink back. When they're in, in, injected with Oncovex GMCSF, the tumors shrink back completely. But the important and interesting observation is that the uninjected tumors also respond well to Oncovex, particularly when the Oncovex is armed with GMCSF. And it's very interesting that if they took those animals that were effectively cured with Oncovex GMCSF and then rechallenged them six months later, they found that um, in control animals, they got a lot of tumors growing in the, in the liver here. But in the pre-injected animals who had developed an immune response against the tumor, um, there were no takes in the, in the liver. So it was remarkable protection um, from, from the tumor. And it did look, it does look as though um, there's a good immune response here generated against the tumor. The agent has been developed through a range of different clinical trials. And it's now in phase three. Um, I won't go through them in great detail, but there were several phase ones and a couple of phase twos. Uh, the melanoma phase two was particularly interesting in that um, when they assessed um, disease responses, they found that 30% of the patients had a partial response or a complete response, and 10% of, of patients um, had a complete response. So, so quite good um, responses for people with stage 3C melanoma, stage 4 melanoma, so quite advanced melanoma. And there were signs of responses in um, distant disease, which did support the possibility that there was a body-wide immune response here. So an impressive, um, impressive way forward. One of the, uh, this is the, the phase three trial design, which is really the make or break of any agent when it goes to licensure. This is a very big study um, in, um, uh, in Melanoma. They've now enrolled 430 patients. Um, and they've targeted the patients who did best in the phase two. So they're excluding patients with extensive visceral disease, um, but, um, and they're including um, patients who came with advanced cancer. They completed the enrollment in June 2011, and I'm sure we'll be trying to get the clinical data out of Bob Coffin when it comes here. So I'm just going to wind up by saying that that biotherapy approach to me looks very promising. The Generex approach, which you're going to hear about um, on Saturday, looks very promising as well. Um, one of the issues that we have, though, is that the Biobex approach is always injected directly into the tumour because it's not a virus that can survive in the bloodstream. And if we're going to develop um, viral therapy as an approach rather than immunotherapy, it's very important that we can develop viruses which are capable of circulating in the bloodstream and reaching disseminated tumours. And there are many different demands on that. I've already spoken about the hematic compatibility issues. But in addition to that, you have to avoid infection of the wrong cells. For example, hepatocytes can be the wrong cells and they can sequester your viruses. There are an awful lot of wrong cells that a virus could go into. If you're trying to target, say, 1% of the body cells in the corn of the tumor, you've got to find a way to make it highly selective for the tumor. Otherwise, the 99% of other cells will mop it up very effectively. And even if you can get your virus as far as the tumor, and getting it to know it's in the tumor, getting it to recognize tumor endothelial cells and extravasate and penetrate through to tumor tissues is a, is a major challenge. So I think this still remains a major issue for virotherapy. And really, in the end, it all comes down to delivery. Um, this is something that we have been working on um, using a, a bioselection approach in order to engineer a virus which is stable in the blood and which we're hoping will be going into clinical trials um, later in the middle of next year. I'm under um, Science and Therapeutics, which I should share, have a, a significant financial interest in. Um, and those are some of the data that the science has shown selectivity of these activities. So in summary, I think the progress that we see, and it is an exciting time. I mean, we, we performed the British Society of Gene Therapy about 10 years ago now, and at, at that time, things didn't look great. Now, there are so many things that are promising that I suspect this field is going to go forward um, with increasing momentum. Partly to reflecting better, better molecular technology, um, judicious choice of vectors, um, but I think also being realistic about what we can do in terms of delivery, and direct delivery is a very sensible approach. 
Um, for gene supplementation, it's very clear that the best results are where you don't have to target every cell, but actually your therapeutic agent is mediated by something that's secreted in the bloodstream. In my view, non-viral technology is still not great. I'm sorry, but um, I've become a, like, with the zeal of a reformed smoker, I'm, I'm much in favor of using viruses these days. Um, and in the virus world, there are certain issues with using RNA viruses, particularly the GM level, because they have less stability than DNA viruses. So for GM viruses, I think DNA wipes the board. Real of course, is an RNA virus, but it's not GM, it's a wild type virus, and it appears to have um, acceptable stability. Systemic delivery is still the main issue, um, and one thing that bugs me more and more is that it's extraordinarily difficult to finance clinical trials of gene therapy without company involvement. The only way we've ever managed to get into the clinics is to start a company and to get investment that way. I think we're not really exploiting the strengths of European academia if we only allow company scientists to move things into clinical trials. If we can address that somehow, I'd be delighted. Those are the things I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much, and I'm taking personal time.